Hey, uh, great pleasure to introduce the speaker from this week, who is Professor Melissa Warden from Cornell at Ithaca. And uh, Melissa had had a very meteoric rise to the leadership of neuroscience, and she started her studies as a grad student in Earl Miller's lab at MIT. And after that, she did a postdoc in Carl Dysrot's lab at Stanford University, and that's where we met. And there she pioneered the use of doing electrical recordings in mice, sorry, in and rats while they were doing the forced swim test, which is a very popular test for depression. And there you might be familiar with the test that the animals sort of underwater and swimming and then um, the amount that he swims is related to an antidepressant effect. And there was a lot of interest to record neural activity in that behavior, but it was difficult because of the water and the water interferes the electrical signal. And then as a very cool example of her ingenuity, she figured out that you could isolate the water from electrical circuits by putting extra large condoms on rat's heads, which would then insulate the water from the electrodes. That's a real scientific paper that was published in Science, so it really shows like the ingenuity of Melissa in solving these intractable problems. And later she went to uh, Cornell University and she established her lab there and she won almost all the Young Investigator Awards, or most of them at least. And she published a very cool paper on science on the dorsal raffae activity. And now she'll tell us about her more recent work after that paper. Okay, well, thank you, Avi, for that very kind um, introduction. I have to say that is the first time that someone has told that story um, in all of the seminars that I've given. So uh, <laughs> it is true. Um, that is how we waterproofed the electrodes in the four swim tasks. Those were the fond memories. Um, so um, thank you, Avi, for inviting me here to give this talk. I'm really excited to, um, to be able to share some of our lab's recent work with you. And I will say that I'm, uh, I'm pretty disappointed not to be able to come in person and visit with people um, because a lot of the scientific luminaries that have um, really influenced my own trajectory um, uh, and have um, have, been, have produced ideas that I spent a lot of my time thinking about are at UCLA. So um, it, is, it is too bad that uh, this is happening during the pandemic, but hopefully someday we will get a chance to meet. So today I'm gonna be telling you about um, some recent work in my lab that is focused on uh, the role of neuromodulation in shaping the balance between goal-directed and reactive behavior. And I will talk a little bit later about what I mean by that. Um, and specifically, I'm gonna be telling you about uh, two of our recent works on um, the serotonin and the dopamine neuromodulatory systems. So, uh, sorry, does somebody have a comment? No, okay. All right, so I'm gonna start off with a video. And this is a video of a kangaroo rat in the New Mexico desert being attacked by a rattlesnake. And I love this video because it illustrates, I think very nicely, a, a form of reactive defense. So this animal see, sees uh, an animal coming right for it. Um, something is looming on its uh, retina. And so it has an immediate response, which is to escape and try to get away from the predator. So this is what I think of as reactive behavior. There's something important going on in the environment and you respond to it. Goal-directed behavior, um, I think is something different. You know, there are, there are a, a number of different ways of thinking about goal-directed behavior. Um, one of which is that uh, you have, you're thinking about the outcome of your actions. And um, here, I wanna illustrate a specific feature of goal-directed behavior that, that I happen to think is very important. 
And that is the ability to act for future goals without getting distracted by uh, stimuli around you. So commitment to goals. And um, uh, here, for example, is Odysseus, who is um, traveling home from the Trojan Wars to his home in Ithaca, which is also where I live. And he is surrounded by sirens who are singing him beautiful songs. And he, he knew that if he listened to the songs that he would get sucked in and um, it would be doom. So he had his sailors put wax in their ears uh, so that they couldn't hear um, the sirens and they would be able to continue going straight for home, but he left his ears open. Uh, he was strapped to the mast uh, um, so that he couldn't do, it, do anything, but he could still hear the beautiful songs. Um, even though he could hear them, the boat was not reacting to this stimuli. It was going for the goal. So this is what I think of and what I mean when I say goal-directed behavior. Okay, so finding an appropriate balance between reactive and goal-directed behavior is really important for our day-to-day -day life. And um, sometimes you wanna be one and sometimes you wanna be the other. So for example, if you're studying for a test in the future, your actions have to be um, oriented towards achieving that future goal of a high grade on the test. Things might come along that try to distract you. For example, your friends might come along and wanna hang out, um, or there might be an earthquake that's shaking your building. Either case, you need to stay on target, or you know, potentially with the earthquake, you might want to you might want to respond. Um, so it's hard to get this balance right uh, between being committed to goals and reacting adaptively to your environment, and uh, an imbalance between goal directed and reactive behavior is. Um, seen in a variety of psychiatric diseases like ADHD, depression, anxiety, and OCD. So here, I want to kind of lay out one of our central hypotheses, which is that um, the balance between serotonin and dopamine neural activity helps regulate the balance between reactivity and goal-directed behavior. And I will present some evidence for that um, during the course of the talk. So there is a, um, a, a prominent hypothesis about uh, the role of serotonin and dopamine in the brain um, that was developed by Nathaniel Daw and Peter Diane and others, in which they propose that serotonin and dopamine function as opponency systems. And the reason that they propose this is, number one, there is a huge anatomical um, interconnectivity between these regions. They both project to each other very strongly. Number two, they appear to have opposite um, impact on uh, different functions. So for example, dopamine is associated with reward. Serotonin uh, has been uh, more prominently associated with punishment, although there is uh, recent evidence that it's also involved in reward. Dopamine promotes movement. It's, in, it's important for movement invigoration. And this is illustrated by uh, um, looking at what happens when uh, you lose your dopamine system. Um, for example, in Parkinson's disease, your, your motions become um, changed and sometimes you become akinetic. Whereas serotonin has been more prominently associated with behavioral inhibition. And so what we think, we do, we do agree with the um, opponency hypothesis, and we specifically want to put forward the hypothesis that it's an opponency between goal-directed behavior mediated by dopamine. Um, there's a long history of looking at the, the role of dopamine in goal-directed behavior. But the data that I'm going to be telling you about today um, uh, is some of the evidence that led us to hypothesize that serotonin and particularly phasic transients, phasic transients um, in serotonin neurons may be important for emotional reactivity. Okay, so the first um, story that I'm gonna be telling you about today is looking at the role of serotonin neurons and emotional reactivity. 
And this work was led by my very first grad student, Cheng Wu So, um, in collaboration with uh, a number of, of other people in my lab. Um, so this is, uh, these are serotonin neurons in the dorsal raphe. So this is a structure right below the uh, periaqueductal gray. And um, the dorsal raphe nucleus is home to the largest group of serotonin neurons in the brain. These neurons project widely throughout the cortex and subcortex. And this is a small nucleus with the potential to exert coordinated control over brain state. It's very widely projecting. There's a lot of evidence for um, a role for serotonin in behavioral inhibition or the inhibition of movement. So if you optically stimulate serotonin neurons, you promote waiting uh, in rodents or patients. Um, optical stimulation also decreases speed in moving animals. Um, if you decrease serotonin by lesioning the serotonin system, um, you prompt uh, impulsive premature responding, um, and you can also um, cause perseveration and um, uh, uh, make it so that animals have a hard time updating their strategies. So there's a lot of evidence for serotonin and behavioral inhibition, but in a parallel thread, there is um, a long history of looking at drugs that influence the serotonin system like fluoxetine or Prozac, um, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And if you give drugs like this to rodents, then it actually promotes move movement in a particular context. So if you look at the four swim test, um, which is basically where you take um, a rodent and you put it in a tank of water for a few minutes, um, and you, you're monitoring how much time it's spending struggling versus how much time it's just spending there, spending floating. Then uh, if you give drugs like fluoxetine, then it will increase the amount of time spent uh, swimming and it will decrease the immobility in this test. Um, this has been interpreted as a reduction in behavioral despair. Um, and uh, this is used as one of the big screens in pharmaceutical companies for finding new antidepressant drugs. And in my own previous work, uh, when we stimulated prefrontal projections to the dorsal raphe, glutamatergic projections, it had the same um, effect. We also promoted movement when these glutamatergic inputs were being excited. So we were very interested in this discrepancy, why serotonin inhibited movement in some contexts, but promoted it in others. And one of the things that we decided to investigate was whether the environmental threat level uh, had an impact on um, the functional role of serotonin. And I will get into why we thought threat intensity was so important. Okay, so I'm gonna first tell you about um, recordings from serotonin neurons. So here we used fiber photometry. We engineer, engineered serotonin neurons to express GCAMP um, so that we can read out uh, population activity with fiber photometry. And um, what we see here is um, the activity of serotonin neurons when animals were engaged in the open field test. So here's the test. We basically just have an, a mouse in an open field. Um, here, the red is movement and the black is uh, the fluorescence from serotonin neurons. And what you can see, this is just one trace from one animal, is that whenever this animal was still, you would see an increase in activity in serotonin neurons. And whenever the animal was moving around, you would see a decrease in activity of serotonin neurons. And so you see this here. So red is speed. So when animals initiate movement, you see a decrease in activity of serotonin neurons here. We see it across the population. Okay, so, so far, um, this is a relatively neutral environment. You can actually shape the valence of this environment depending on you know, lighting and things like, like this. But um, what we see so far uh, is consistent with the behavioral inhibition theory. More serotonin, uh, more activity in serotonin neurons equals less movement. So this is open field. Now, uh, we wanted to look at, we wanted to look systematically at movement in a variety of environments at a variety of different threat levels. So we decided to record from serotonin neurons uh, during active avoidance. And this is a task where there's a two-sided chamber. 
the mouse is on one side to begin with. Um, it hears a tone. And if it, success, if it successfully moves to the other side of the chamber uh, within a certain amount of time, then it doesn't get a shock. Um, if it fails to cross, then it will get a shock. And it can turn the shock off by moving to the other side. We consider this a moderately aversive environment because the mouse has a chance to avoid the shock. It doesn't have to experience the shock. We would consider uh, the shock a highly aversive environment. And we find the same thing here. So uh, whenever animals are moving around in this environment, uh, you see a decrease in activity of serotonin neurons, just like we saw in the open field. Then we decided to test a highly aversive environment. And it actually, um, it, it took us a while to really appreciate the aversive nature of the tail suspension test. I had been thinking about it as a, a screen for depression related behavior for a long time. But um, if you read about the early history of this test, um, you realize that people very explicitly thought about this as an aversive environment. And um, one of the prompts for me to think about this test like this was actually a comment from um, a behaviorally oriented grad student in my lab who was watching the video of a mouse in the TST one day at lab meeting. And her comment was that it looked like a predator had picked up the mouse and it was captured. And um, that was actually a very important comment because it, it really kind of shifted uh, our interpretation of what was going on in this test. Um, and I'll, I'll also show you some data from another highly aversive environment, but just uh, starting with the tail suspension test, what we saw here was actually the opposite profile um, in the physiology of serotonin neurons. So here, instead of decreasing their activity whenever animals were moving around, instead they increased their activity when animals moved. So you can see here that um, uh, the movement is in red. Every time the animal was struggling in this test, you would see a, a burst of activity in serotonin neurons. And um, we see this across the population of animals. We also looked at uh, what happens when animals are moving um, in the presence of shock. So here we just capitalized on the failed avoidance trials uh, in the active avoidance task. We looked at specifically those trials where animals didn't um, avoid the shock, but instead uh, actually received the shock. And so we looked at their escape movement to the other side of the chamber. And here we saw the same thing, which is that when animals were moving in this environment, you saw a burst of activity in serotonin neurons. We also see the same thing in individual neurons. So all the experiments that I've showed you before were fiber photometry, but if we do the same thing with microendoscopy, um, we can actually see uh, individual neurons, um, for example, this one right here, where you see elevated activity during pauses um, this is in the open field test. But then uh, if we just continue the recording and we go into the tail suspension test, all of a sudden this neuron is now responding when animals are moving in the tail suspension test. So we not only see this on an individual, uh, on a population level, we see this in individual neurons. So the physiology is telling us that um, serotonin neurons increase their activity during movement um, in uh, highly aversive environments like the tail suspension test or escape from shock, but they decrease their activity during movements in less stressful contexts. What happens if we stimulate serotonin neurons? Uh, so we asked this and we addressed this by using optogenetics to control the activity of serotonin neurons while mice were engaging in these same tasks. And what we, and we basically went through the same battery of tasks. And what we found here, if we look again at active avoidance, uh, this is moderately aversive. We basically just um, uh, delivered optogenetic stimulation uh, right at the onset of the tone for the first three seconds of an eight second tone. And then we looked at the impact on the mouse's speed and on the latency to avoidance. And here, if you look at the speed, uh, if you look right at light onset, um, if uh, we were looking at the channel Robson group, we saw a decrease in speed when we turn the light on. But if we look at YFP control group, um, we don't see any change uh, in, in speed. Uh, and we see that here uh, across the group of animals. And if we look at the latency to successful avoidance, we see that it is shifted towards longer latencies uh, when we're stimulating these animals. So 
This is consistent with the physiology data that I showed you. Activating serotonin neurons causes animals to um, reduce their movement. Uh, and we, we did the same thing in a variety of other behavioral tests like the open field and we found the same thing. If on the other hand, we look at a highly diversive environment, the tail suspension test, we see the opposite. Um, here, instead of promoting behavioral inhibition, stimulation of dorsal raphe serotonin neurons actually promotes movement. So when we turn uh, the light off, the light on randomly um, uh, during this test, then we see uh, an increase in speed in these animals. So overall, we found that stimulating serotonin neurons suppresses movement at low to moderate threat levels and promotes movement at high threat levels, um, but serotonin neural, neural activity decreases on movement onset at low to moderate threat, but increases on movement onset at high threat. So there appears to be this dividing line between uh, highly aversive environments and all other environments that we have tested. Um, although right now in the lab, we are continuing this work by testing um, extreme positive environments, like for example, uh, mating, and uh, we're still collecting data on that. So, um, so right now, we, um, we think that we're seeing this dividing line right here between highly aversive and moderately aversive environments. So I wanna take a minute to talk about what this might mean and our hypothesis for um, an explanation for why we might be seeing this. So if you just think about movement, there's been a switch in the function of dorsal raphe serotonin neurons when animals are in high threat, high threat situations. We spent a lot of time thinking about why this might be. Um, potential neural mechanisms and uh, underlying reasons for this switch. And we, we started to get some insight when we started thinking about what it means when mice are engaging in movements in these different situations. Specifically, what does it mean when a mouse moves in a high threat situation? And what does it mean when a mouse stops moving in a moderate threat situation? And here, um, I, um, I wanna say that uh, the work of Michael Fenslow at UCLA was actually hugely transformative for my own thinking about this. I spent a lot of time reading about predatory imminence theory and how behavior uh, systematically changes when threats um, are further or closer to the animal. And um, there are systematic behavioral changes that we see when, when animals are in these different um, environments at different threat levels. So when animals are in environments at high threat, you tend to see escape movements. Um, this is when there's an immediate threat to survival like a predator strike and speed here is important. Um, the most important thing is to escape and to get away from the predator. At moderate threat, um, we see things like pausing or freezing. And I think fear conditioning is an example of this um, kind of environment. So here, there's a tone that indicates that you are going to be shocked in the future, um, but you're not being shocked right now. And so when animals learn fear conditioning, they freeze in response to the tone. When they're actually experiencing the shock, they jump around. And we think of this as a, a vigilant situational evaluation in the face of potential threat. And then if you get to um, lower threat levels and positive situations, um, lower threat, you might just start to see things like avoidance behavior. Uh, and this is things like uh, the ability to suppress the freeze uh, so that you can strategically respond to a threat. Um, or things like avoidance or, or altered space use, things like uh, avoiding the center of an open field or avoiding the arms of an ele elevated plus maze. At lowest threat levels, we see things like the pursuit of goals where animals are uh, taking care of their basic needs. And all of these behaviors can be slower uh, because if you um, miss uh, and don't successfully obtain a meal this one time, you'll likely live again uh, to pursue another one. On the other hand, if you fail to escape from a predator, you're probably not gonna continue um, living and passing on your DNA. So, um, okay, but it was uh, by thinking about these levels of threat that we started thinking about what our serotonin signal might mean and why it might switch at very high threat levels. 
So we think that brief stimulation of serotonin neurons may trigger an adaptive behavioral or emotional reaction to current conditions. Um, we think that the high movement or the elevated movement that we're seeing in high threat environments may be something like an escape, uh, potentially something like running when a hawk is looming. And that the uh, behavioral inhibition that we see in low to moderate threat environments, um, it might be something like uh, a freezing reaction, potentially like a freeze when a, a hawk is coasting overhead. And we think of phasic serotonin neural activity uh, may be a potential neural substrate for prioritizing now, uh, react to your current environment, um, as opposed to a system they may, that may promote um, commitment to future goals. And we're currently testing whether this hypothesis also holds for positively balanced uh, environments. In particular mating, we have a very um, interesting active study on uh, the role of serotonin neural activity in mating ongoing right now. And we think that this data, um, uh, it, it's relevant to some of the known features of psychiatric drugs that influence the serotonin system. Uh, for example, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, um, you need to take them for several weeks in order to see therapeutic efficacy. And during initial treatment, um, you actually see a worsening of some symptoms like anxiety. Um, and uh, so this is an example of uh, fear conditioning data. Uh, if you give animals, rodents, uh, acute SSRIs, it will increase freezing. But if rodents have been on chronic SSRIs for a long time, then you'll actually see decreased freezing in fear conditioning. And we think that this goes well, uh, basically what we think this means is we think that um, we think that phasic serotonin activity may be prompting these emotional reactions, but if, uh, and this is, this is a hypothesis, this is speculative, but our current idea is that maybe um, SSRIs may be holding serotonin at a high level. Um, we know that we see lots of uh, postsynaptic receptor adaptation, and we think that we might be blunting out the response, the emotional response to serotonin transients. And there is a lot of evidence that uh, SSRIs can induce emotional blunting. And this is viewed as a side effect, but we actually think that this may be very, this may be core to how SSRI antidepressants work. Um, when people are on SSRIs for a long time, you see much less uh, emotional reactivity. Okay, so, um, so everything that I've told you so far is outlining the data that we've uh, obtained from the serotonin system and the hypothesis that this has led us towards. Um, I'm about to start talking about dopamine. I'm wondering if people have any questions on the serotonin work before I move on to the next part of the talk. But if not, that's fine. I'll just keep going. We can we can do questions at the end. Okay. So, all right. For the second half of my talk, I'm going to tell you about some recent work that we've done on um, the role of the dopamine system in goal-directed behavior. Now, there's a long history of research in uh, linking dopamine to goal-directed behavior. Um, and here, I hope we've been able to uh, add to the picture a little bit. So this work was led by my grad student, uh, Akash Guru. And this is a project that focuses on ramping activity in dopamine neurons. Okay, so um, what do we know about dopamine? So if you record electrical activity from dopamine neurons, um, seminal experiments by uh, Wolfram Schultz and colleagues back in the 90s showed that uh, dopamine neurons, um, single dopamine neurons appear to encode reward prediction error. So um, if an animal is learning a Pavlovian task and there is a um, stimulus, a cue that predicts that a reward is going to happen and the animal has learned this association um, over many trials, then dopamine neurons fire uh, whenever, um, whenever something unpredicted happens that 
gives the animal information that it might use to predict that a reward is going to happen. So this neuron here fires when the cue appears, um, but it doesn't actually fire when the reward happens because it's it has been predicted. Okay. About um, six or seven years ago, uh, Anne Graybill's group published a really beautiful paper looking at long time scale um, dopamine activity. And here they specifically looked at dopamine release in the ventral striatum. So this is not spiking activity in dopamine neurons, it's dopamine release. And what they found is that as animals um, navigate towards goals, they recorded a gradually rising release of dopamine or dopamine concentration, I should say, in the ventral striatum as animals got closer and closer to the goal. And we found this uh, very interesting because this result had not been predicted by reward prediction error theory. And I think there was a lot of conversation about what these signals might mean and what is the proper framework um, that we should be thinking about when we're thinking about these ramping signals. Okay, so we see ramps in dopamine release in um, the ventromedial striatum as animals move towards goal. So some of the questions uh, about ramping dopamine are things like how is the ramping dopamine signal used? And the major theories have centered around um, learning and regulating ongoing behavior or motivation. And, um, uh, and so there have been um, theories that these ramps might uh, represent spatial proximity to the goal. This was uh, the original um, Engrabial paper. Um, uh, Kate Wassum here uh, has published uh, some really beautiful work that has been very influential for me on linking dopamine ramps to uh, motivation. Um, Josh Burke's lab has also published on this and some more recent work has uh, tried to link rending activity and dopamine neurons to reward prediction error. So here we wanted to systematically look at some of these hypotheses um, to see if we could constrain some of the theories about ramping dopamine. And so the way I'm gonna tell you about this data is I'm just going, to, uh, I'm gonna tell you kind of in the way that these experiments happened. So um, we basically approached this by asking questions, getting answers, and then coming up with new hypotheses. Um, it was kind of a case study and scientific method for us, just systematically going through all of um, the features of, of the environment that maybe needed to support uh, dopamine ramping and what this tells us about how ramps may be generated. So uh, we started this experiment, uh, these experiments several years ago, and uh, the first question we asked was, does no, uh, neural activity in VTA dopamine neurons ramp up as animals approach goals? And uh, a number of groups had seen this at this point, but at the time, um, you know, this was uh, an unanswered question. So. Uh, what we did, uh, we used fiber photometry again to record calcium activity in the population of VTA dopamine neurons. And the task that we used was very simple. So Engravial's task was a T maze where the animal had to choose right or left. Ours was really stripped down to just the bare essentials. So all this mouse is doing is running from one end to another and picking up rewards. It starts at one end, it goes to the other end, it picks up a reward, and then it runs back and it gets another reward. And one side is big, one side is small reward. So pretty simple. So what do we find here? So here, um, this is, uh, this orange trace here is speed, and the black trace is the activity of dopamine neurons. And this is a trace, uh, an example trace from one animal. And here, what you can see is, so this is, this is the run. This animal's running towards the big reward. Um, this is mostly when it's doing its running. And this is uh, the reward that it gets at the end. So when this animal is running towards the big reward, we see a prominent ramping up of activity um, in dopamine neurons. So uh, from this experiment, we know that it's not just dopamine release in the ventral striatum, but it's also activity in dopamine neurons that's ramping as animals approach goals. And um, 
if you look at average activity, um, this is what dopamine ramps look like as animals run towards the big reward. This is what it looks like as they run towards the small reward. So um, on average, we're seeing uh, that reward size influences um, the slope of the ramp. Unexpectedly, we found something very interesting when we looked at the time course of the emergence of dopamine ramps. So I had gone into this experiment assuming that it would take ramps a long time to emerge. And the reason I thought that is because there have been a number of papers published showing that it, takes, it can take a long time to see reward prediction error signals in dopamine neurons. Um, it can take anywhere from um, 100 trials to 1,000, depending on the paradigm that you're using, to start to see reward prediction error signals uh, toward to cues uh, in, in spiking activity in dopamine neurons. And so we thought that it would take a while for us to see ramps. But we actually found something very different that was very surprising to us. Um, and what we found was that we saw ramps on the very first trial after the mouse knew that there was a reward. So what the data that you see here, um, these are all completely naive mice. They have never been trained on any behavioral task. And what we did is we took them out and we uh, started recording activity in their dopamine neurons. We put them on the track, but we blocked off access to the rewards at first. And we just let them explore the track for about five minutes. Then we take out the blocks and spontaneously the mouse will discover that there's a reward available at one of the ends. And then it runs around some more. And on the very next trial that it goes back to that reward location, we see ramping activity in dopamine neurons. So it emerges as soon as the animal knows that the, the reward is there. So um, I think this is very important because it already says that what that the neural mechanisms underlying ramping activity in dopamine neurons may be pretty different than the phasic reward prediction error signal that we see when we um, give uh, transient cues that indicate future rewards. Okay. So, um, does neural activity in BTA dopamine neurons ramp up as animals approach goals? Yes. We then asked, is a goal required? Or, um, you know, we thought that yes, probably a goal was required, but we wanted to test whether um, just movement through a spatial environment could produce ramps. Um, do we actually need to move through space? Do we need continuously changing external sensory information to produce ramps? Or is it possible that an internal representation of distance might be sufficient to support ramping activity in dopamine neurons? So we address these questions by um, training mice to run on a stationary wheel for a specified distance. And here, just look at the, at the top group of animals at first. So this is the contingent group. Um, reward is contingent on behavior. So this animal's running on the wheel, um, its job is to continuously run for at least five turns and stop before nine turns. And if it does that, a cue light is, uh, is turned on and a reward is delivered. And uh, we also did a non-contingent group where these mice could run if they wanted to, but they didn't have to. And then at the end, a cue uh, and reward were delivered using the schedule determined by the contingent group. So we basically just played back um, the timing that we recorded from the contingent group to the non-contingent group. So these mice don't have to do anything. They run, they get rewards, but there's no relationship between the two. So here is a mouse um, engaging in this behavior. And so you can see, so it's, it's fiber photometry, so it's moving pretty freely. It's just running on the wheel and it learns to run a certain distance and then you see it collecting the reward at the end of the trial if it's correctly performed the trial. 
And we actually were surprised again. We didn't think we were gonna see ramps here, but we did. We actually, my grad student and I had a bet on this. Um, it turns out we see, rope, we, we see ramps here and they're actually more robust than we see in any other behavioral task. So here, um, this is the orange is movement. So this is the animal speed as it's running on the wheel. And this is when the reward is delivered. These are licks. Uh, so you can see really nice ramping up um, uh, as the animal is approaching the reward using its internal model to navigate. This is an example animal from the non-contingent group where they could run and there were rewards, but there was no relationship between the two. And here we saw no ramp ramping activity. Instead, we saw a burst of activity um, upon cue presentation, uh, which is what we might expect um, from prior dopamine neural recordings. Okay, um, so this is average activity from the contingent group where we see ramping and the non-contingent group where we don't see ramping. So um, is a goal required? Yes, if animals are just running on the wheel, but it's not for the purposes of obtaining a goal, we don't see any ramps. Um, is progression through space required? Um, we found that uh, continuously changing external sensory information was not required. So uh, when the animal is running on the wheel, there is no indicator that tells the mouse that it is getting closer to the goal and when to stop. It just has to do that um, based on an internal representation of distance. Um, and so this to us indicates that uh, an internal model of goal progress is sufficient to support dopamine ramps and sensory feedback is not required. We next asked whether movement was required. So here, um, we designed a task where um, we tried to replicate what was going on on the track, but we wanted uh, the animal to be able to do this task without any movement. So um, my graduate student uh, built um, a system where we could do this. He basically uh, took a linear actuator and mounted a cue light and a reward on the actuator. And then um, uh, basically what would happen is at the beginning, uh, and this is essentially classical, classical conditioning, at the beginning of the trial, the cue light would illuminate and the cue and the reward would start moving together towards the mouse. And um, the mouse was sitting there with a, a transparent pane of glass in front of, or transparent plexiglass of glass in front of its face with a little hole in it. And so when the reward got to the hole, it could just drink the reward. Um, and we also did uh, more classically conditioning uh, type experiments where instead of the reward and cue being on an actuator moving toward the mouse, instead they were just mounted on the wall right next to the mouse. Same timing, same everything else. Um, the only difference is the reward isn't, the reward and the cue aren't moving. And so here uh, is an example of a mouse doing this behavior. So the mouse is sitting here waiting for the reward. The cue light illuminates and then um, starts moving towards the mouse and then it can obtain the reward. So this is, um, this is Pavlovian conditioning, uh, basically. The animal doesn't have to do anything, but we still have this systematic change in distance between the animal and the reward. And again, we found ramps here. And again, we were surprised about this. Um, so here you can see, uh, this is an animal doing this task. Um, this uh, uh, orange line right here is indicating the uh, reward proximity. Um, and this is the activity in dopamine neurons. So we see a nice ramping up of, act of uh, activity in dopamine neurons as the cue and the reward approach the mouse. And this is what we see on average in the conditions where the cue and the reward were on the actuator and were approaching the mouse. And these are the conditions where the cue and reward were mounted on the wall right in front of the mouse and were not, not moving. So we see ramping activity here, but what we see here looks like cue-driven uh, cue reward prediction error that gradually fades and then another burst on reward consumption. So this is very similar to uh, classic reward prediction error responses in dopamine neurons. So is movement required? No. We then asked, and actually this turned out to be the most uh, important um, question that we asked. We didn't appreciate why when we asked it. 
we were interested in looking at whether ramps uh, evolved with experience. And um, one, of the, one of the reasons that we asked this is because one of the ideas in reward prediction error theory is that you see um, the progression of the uh, dopamine response earlier and earlier in the trial until you start seeing the burst on Q presentation. And we wanted to see if we saw something like that um, in dopamine ramps. So we saw something actually pretty different. Um, so first we looked at how dopamine ramps evolved when mice were just running back and forth on the linear track. So this is uh, a task where there is sensory information about goal proximity, but it's simple. They just have to run it back and forth. And we started recording activity in dopamine neurons um, right from the very first session. And we just kept recording for um, several weeks. And what we found is that uh, as I mentioned before, ramping activity is actually very strong on uh, the first session. In fact, we saw strong ramps on the very first trial after the mouse had discovered the location of the reward. And what we find is that as time goes on, ramping activity becomes um, uh, weaker and weaker until it's almost faded away. And uh, it comes back when you reverse the position of the rewards. And actually, I was thrilled to discover um, Kate Wassum's paper uh, from a few years ago, where she saw the same phenomenon. And it, it made us feel slightly less insane about this data. Um, so we were, it's a, it's a wonderful paper. We were very, we were very happy to see it. Um, Okay, so that's what we see on the linear track. You see a big ramp at first and then fading away as animals learn. If we are looking at passive mice where the reward is approaching them, um, we also see a fading away of reward, but it's a little different. So uh, it takes a while for uh, mice to learn where the position or uh, to make the association between the cue and the reward. Um, I think it's just not as much feedback as running down a linear track and their brains are not as naturally wired to process that kind of information. But what we see, uh, what we saw was over the course of several days as animals learned, um, if we just look at the fraction of trials with positive slope, um, we use this metric to be agnostic about actual um, ramp slope. Then what we see is that um, over a few days, you, you start to see the evolution towards ramping activity. So you, you see this in like sessions four or sessions five. And then as animals continue to learn, you see that Q uh, related activity starts to dominate. So we see a burst on, on the Q. And because of that, we start to see an, actually even a, a negative ramp um, slope in dopamine neural activity. Then, most interestingly, I think, um, we looked at the evolution of ramping activity in dopamine neurons as animals were running on the wheel for rewards. And here we found something really qualitatively different. So I'm not showing from the beginning because it actually takes them a while to learn to run long distances on this task. But what we see is, um, so first of all, um, on these sessions six, six and seven, you see this kind of, um, it's not a linear ramp, um, but it's kind of an accelerating ramp as animals are heading towards the goal. Uh, this is actually similar to what we see on session one on the linear track, although that turns into more of a flat ramp as we go on in sessions. Here on the wheel, we never lose that. So we're, we constantly maintain that shape of ramping activity, but also we never see that it fades away. So. Um, if you look at the fraction of trials with positive slope, here um, uh, trials, we, we basically see a, a strong majority of trials where um, uh, the slopes are, are positive. And uh, this pattern of activity persists for as long as we record. And it's very different than what we see on the linear track where randing starts strong, but eventually you see that it starts to fade away. Okay. Now this is, I think, so we found this very interesting because this task is unique among all of the tasks that we tested because this is the one task where there is no sensory information that the animal can use to tell how close it is to the goal. It has to use its internal model. There's no counter or bar or anything that's allowing it to keep track. So it just has to, it just has to keep a model um, in its head 
And the other two tasks, you could use sensory information. So um, we think that there's something important about associating sensory information with gold proximity that actually leads to the flattening of the ramp. Because in the one task where they can't do that, the ramps stick around seemingly forever. Okay, so do ramps evolve with experience? Um, on the track and in classical conditioning, the two tasks where there was sensory feedback, we find that they do evolve, they tend to go away. On the wheel, where there's no um, informative sensory information and animals must use an internal model, we see that ramps persist. So let me just talk a little bit about what this might mean. So we think that our findings support the hypothesis that ramping activity and dopamine neurons signifies the use of a cognitive map or an internal model of goal proximity. Um, and why do we think this? We think this because ramping activity in dopamine neurons appears immediately when naive mice engage in spatial navigation. Um, they don't need to um, uh, uh, train up a model um, where uh, reward information is propagating back from the, the goal state. Rather, we see strong ramping activity immediately. Um, we find that ramping activity it persists indef indefinitely when an internal representation of goal progress is required, but it fades when changing sensory cues are available to guide behavior. So um, this use of an internal model we think is very important because ramps go away if you are not required to use one. Ramps also don't require physical movement. Um, and you know, there's been uh, some theorizing about what ramps flight might mean. One idea is um, effort. Here, our findings argue at, against at least physical effort, but they may be compatible with cognitive effort. And our findings also cast doubt on the hypothesis that dopamine ramps reflect the reward prediction error term in temporal difference learning algorithms. Um, first of all, there's no time for repeated uh, reward sampling and updating. The animal apparently knows um, where the reward is and uh, from the very first trial. And there's also been some recent work um, uh, looking at the impact of systematically changing sensory cues on dopamine ramps using a TD learning framework. And the model actually predicted the opposite of what we found. So um, it, uh, it, it was predicted that, or if you use a TD learning model to try to explain dopamine ramps, um, you see that uh, systematically changing sensory cues actually promote ramping activity, but ramps flatten um, when, uh, uh, when their ramps should flatten when there's no systematic sensory information. Um, so if we put this all together, uh, it leads us to hypothesize that um, ramping activity in dopamine neurons may reflect uh, goal proximity information from other parts of the brain that have been shown to have these kinds of representations. For example, there's been a lot of recent work um, looking at uh, neural activity in ventral hippocampus as animals approach goals. And there have been some papers showing that um, uh, activity in um, ventral hippocampus neurons can actually ramp up as animals approach rewards. Uh, Buzaki, for example, had a paper back on this back in 2010. And um, I think this is one possibility. I think orbitofrontal cortex is another possibility. But there are parts of the brain that do these exact computations that um, allow animals to read out how close they are to goals. Uh, we know that um, orbitofrontal cortex sends a direct projection to dopamine neurons and the ventral hippocampus um, projects, uh, sends a massive projection to the uh, ventral striatum and influences dopamine uh, neural activity via the ventral striatum. So I think that there are a number of anatomical routes where information like this could get to dopamine neurons. And so some of the ongoing work that we have in the lab right now are things like trying to inhibit ventral hippocampal projections to ventral striatum and look at the influence that this might have on ramping activity in dopamine neurons. Okay, so um, that's it for me today. I want to thank uh, especially the people that were um, uh, 
authors on these two projects, although um, I also want to thank my, my whole lab for uh, critical feedback on this work. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, thank you, Professor Wharton, for that very illuminating talk. And now we can have some questions. And because it's happening through Zoom, we'll have to do it a little differently. So mm -hmm. uh, there are already two questions that were posted in the chat. Then I could read those and then Professor Wharton could uh, answer them. So if you would like to uh, ask a question, you could either write it in the chat and then I could read it out loud, or if you want to ask yourself, just uh, message me privately, then I'll ask you when it's your turn to unmute yourself, ask um, the question. And I highly encourage that the first questions are asked by our trainees, especially the students and postdocs, before Professor Warden gets swamped with questions from the faculty. Okay, so the two questions we have so far is, the first one is, uh, is the mechanism behind the known atonia flat affect side effect of SSRI similar to the decreased activity in the animal preparation? Um, so it's unknown. So we, you know, we speculate that, um, so we don't actually, we think that the activity of serotonin neurons may be similar um, in, uh, in, uh, I guess, uh, in animals that have been on SSRIs for a long time, although there are some, there is some evidence for, di for differences. But we actually, you know, we think more about downstream. Um, we think about how signals from serotonin neurons are being interpreted by downstream brain regions. So, for example, you know, one of the things we've been thinking a lot about recently is the amygdala, because um, especially the central amygdala. It's known that there are different populations of cells that promote uh, escape behavior or freezing behavior. And, um, you know, one of our hypotheses is that uh, depending on the current state of the central amygdala, um, and we have a variety of mechanisms in mind for what might be setting state there, you might see that different populations of neurons are activated. Um, depending on whether animals are in a high threat state or moderate threat state. So you might trigger a freezing response or a, 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 an escape response. That's totally speculative speculation right now. You know, we have just a little bit of preliminary data on that. But, um, and also structures like the PAG may be important. Um, basically other brain structures that participate in defensive behavior. Um, so we think, we think that phasic transients of serotonin may be interpreted differently by downstream brain areas. And actually just um, to make an analogy, so when we think about the role of dopamine in movement, we don't think about um, dopamine promoting a particular movement. Um, we think about dopamine facilitating all movements. We think of serotonin the same way, but for emotional movements. So I don't think that uh, I, I would find it unlikely that activity in serotonin neurons would promote one particular kind of physical movement, but the idea of promoting a generalized emotional reaction that depends on context, it makes sense given the widespread anatomical connectivity and the results that, that we found. That was a big answer. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, second question from Danielle Almeida Filio, which is, hello, Dr. Warden. What is the percentage of serotonin neurons that are correlated with behavior? Mm -hmm. um, hi, Daniel. <laughs> um, so most of the neurons that we, uh, single neurons that we record are correlated with behavior, but only about half of the uh, behaviorally modulated neurons, we see the, this inversion um, of response during moderate, uh, between moderate and high threat environments. Um, and the other half uh, will do the same thing in both environments. So there's clearly a diversity uh, within the serotonin system. Um, and we don't know anything yet about whether there are, like neurons with these different response properties might project to different parts of the brain, for example. Um, but uh, it's, this is a, you know, this is, that's a hypothesis that we're entertaining right now that you might see different modulation in different brain regions 
Okay, so the next question is from Michael Ryan. So Michael Ryan, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay, thank you. Hi, Dr. Ward, that was a really interesting talk. Um, I guess one question that came to mind as I sort of tried to put myself um, in sort of the, the mind of a mouse on these tasks um, is that in the wheel task, in addition to the lack of sensory feedback, I could also imagine that the animal's certainty um, is also different since the other two tasks are very straightforward. And that after a couple of trials, perhaps you understand the rule much more clearly, whereas on the on the wheel, there is sort of a variable um, goal in mind, I guess you can say, because I think it was between five and nine wheel turns, it was able to be rewarded. And so I wonder if you just train these animals for much, much longer to where they almost always responded after the fifth wheel turn. Um, do you think that that would that would um, make any difference? So it's possible we've gone we've gone out about three weeks and we haven't seen changes in ramping activity. Um, it doesn't mean that it couldn't happen with really extensive overtraining. I do think that, I think that certainty question is important. Um, this is something that we've thought about. So uh, Christopher Fiorillo had this paper with Wolfram Schultz, um, 2003, I can't remember exactly when, but they showed that um, if you just took monkeys in a classical conditioning task and you delivered the reward probabilistically, they saw ramping in single trial or in single neurons, um, really only in the, the, the cases where the monkey was uncertain about whether it was gonna get the reward or not. In the 100% predictive reward, they didn't see it. In the 0% predictive reward, they didn't see it. In the 50%, they did. And uh, so I think that uncertainty is important. If you ask me what I really think about what's going on here, I think that uncertainty is one example of a process that drives cognition. Um, if I'm uncertain about the outcome, I'm likely to be attending more to the task and thinking about where I am relative to the reward. We don't know this, but there, there are suggestive examples um, from the literature and actually from, from our work, some of the stuff that I, I didn't talk about. So um, if we look at, we've, we've specifically tried to tease out whether attention to the goal is important. And so we looked at uh, wheel runs where animals either did the trial correctly or they did it incorrectly. They were either uh, ran too short or too long and this here is that when animals were uh, getting trials correct, and we think that this means because there's no external sensory information, they have to be cognitively, cognitively engaged. We see nice ramps here. And we see that when animals are getting trials wrong, um, either because they're running too short or because they're running too long, we see that the ramps are much less. And, uh, you can kind of see that here where we just plotted slope for correct trials or incorrect trials. And here we've explicitly looked at the length of the run and uh, versus slope. And so for this kind of sweet spot of runs that are you know, the, really a good length, we see higher ramps, but if the uh, runs are too short or too long, the ramps go down. And we interpret this to mean that when the mouse is cognitively engaged in the task and it's actually tracking its performance, that's when you see the ramping activity. And we don't know this, but we think that when animals are uncertain about the outcome, they're likely to be attending more so that they can figure out the rules and they can understand how to, how to shape their, how to, how to behave in the future. Um, that's speculative, but that's our current idea for what's going on. But I think, I, I absolutely think that certainty is very important. It's a good question. Thanks. Yep. Okay, so next question is from Matthew Rosenberg. Does neurotransmitter co-release phenomena play a role in your current thinking of, about these systems? That is a very interesting question. Um, this is something that I have, I have thought about, but we haven't done any work on it yet. Um, a lot of, okay, so there are a few things going on. So we know that, for example, um, dopamine neurons that project to the ventral striatum also uh, co-release glutamate. Um, there 
there are, uh, there's some evidence that there's glutamate co-transmission with serotonin neurons. Um, so I try to be careful to say serotonin neurons and dopamine neurons throughout my presentation. Sometimes I slip. We don't actually know. So co-transmission could, could be very important. Um, and it's something that um, we're very interested in, both for fast neurotransmission like glutamate, but I think even more so, uh, we're really interested in neuropeptide uh, co-transmission at this point, um, because I think there's some very interesting differences in time scale um, in how neuropeptides are operating in the brain that I think, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a strong interest. So, you know, I don't have a great answer, but it's definitely something we're thinking about. Okay, so next talk, uh, sorry, next uh, question from Daisia Allen. Excellent talk, thank you. For the serotonin work you presented, do you know, hypothesize what is encoding the difference between moderate and high threat to modulate serotonin activity? Yeah, that's an excellent question. This is something we have spent a lot of time thinking about. So um, we don't know, but there are at least two major systems that um, respond during the flight or flight, flight or flight response. So, and this is how we think of high threat states. So one is norepinephrine. Um, norepinephrine, you see phasic bursts when animals are kind of engaging in everyday cognition, but when they are in high threat states, for example, in the tail suspended test, or I think for swim test, um, you see a massive rise in uh, tonic um, norepinephrine release. Um, so this sort of switch of norepinephrine to uh, tonic, I think is a great candidate. Um, and it's actually our favorite hypothesis right now, just because we see the switching set in so quickly. Um, basically we hang a mouse up by the tail and all of a sudden the, the neurons are switching. Another possibility is corticotropin releasing factor um, because it's known that um, you see, for example, um, well, you see release of corticotropin releasing factor in stressful environments. You see um, changes in uh, receptor expression as animals in, uh, undergo prolonged stress. Right now, we are thinking about this as a candidate maybe more for long-term effects like learned helplessness. Um, we don't know, um, but you know, we're doing some work trying to modulate uh, norepinephrine tone to see if it has an impact on um, uh, activity, uh, what, what stimulating serotonin neurons does. We have some preliminary data. Um, uh, if we give animals propranolol, it um, blocks the switching effect uh, when we optogenetically stimulate serotonin neurons, but that is just in um, a couple of animals. So we don't have a lot of confidence in that result yet. But that's what we're thinking about right now is everything that happens in the the brain when animals go into this fight or flight state, we think is a, is a candidate for the switching effect. Uh, so next question, uh, similar to the curare or trolley preparation demonstrating response not necessary for maze spatial learning, intrabehaviorally, would you hypothesize that the dopamine spike towards or at the goal may or may not be related to anticipation or frustrative non-partial reward or simply excitatory or related to sensitization? So I, I think that it may be related to these concepts. I think it's actually a pure reflection of distance to the goal. Um, and I think that, the, and the reason I think that is, um, because uh, experiments like um, our track experiment, where we see the fading of uh, uh, ramping activity and dopamine neurons fairly quickly, on um, day three, the ramps are already pretty blunted, but we don't see it when animals actually need to think about how close they are to the goal. For example, on, uh, on the wheel where they have no sensory feedback. We think that, so it may, it may be that anticipation or, um, Frustration, it may be that some of these states are associated with ramping activity and dopamine neurons, but we don't actually think that that's what's driving the activity. We think it's a pure readout of distance to goal. It's modulated by the value of the reward. So there's extra information coming in about that, but 
um, I don't think that you need to think about all of these things. I think that you can think about it just in terms of distance to goal, and that's enough. The brain can do that computation. That being said, you know, when animals know they're a certain distance from a goal, there is there are likely things like anticipation happening. And we don't know whether that's, we, we don't think that's driving dopamine neurons, but it, it certainly may be an impact of um, activity in dopamine neurons. So, you know, I, one of the things I haven't talked about today is how ramps affect ongoing behavior and learning. And um, so it may be that, that dopamine is doing something in the ventral striatum that is causing a feeling of anticipation, for example. Um, but we don't think that feelings like that are the drivers of this signal. Okay, so uh, if anyone else has any questions, please, oh, there's any questions, please. I am curious about the definition of goal. In the classical conditioning task, there is no agency on the rodent's part to reach the reward, but there is anticipation. Mm -hmm. Would anticipation of reward better fitting than goal per se? The reason I don't, I hear that, I hear that. And I, I will say that we thought about this as an anticipation for a long time. Anticipation is an emotion <laughs> um, and it has a lot of flavor to it. And I don't think you need it when you're thinking about, um, about what's going on here. I think that it's sufficient to say that the animal has a goal in its mind and it knows how far away the goal is. And I don't think you need anything else. I think that anticipation could be associated with this, but I think that if you just talk about the most stripped down possible um, hypothesis for what might be producing ramps, there are structures in the brain that code distance to goals. And um, I, I don't know how animals feel when these, these neurons are active, but I do know that they're encoding distance to goal. So that's how we think about it right now. I don't wanna um, minimize the importance of things like anticipation because ultimately what we're going for is an understanding of the brain and all of these things that are in the brain like the anticipatory state. But our focus right now is just on the metrics of the spatial environment. And we think it's enough to explain, explain this data. So I have a question myself. So your data showed nicely, as you said, that the neurons can encode distance to the goal. Uh, but mm -hmm. have you thought of seeing if the neurons can encode a distance in another dimension, such as time yeah. to the goal? Yes. Like yes. the path is that it's not a running wheel, and then there's a light appears. And then after five seconds, there's a two second window within which he could get the goal. So he has to yeah. just, that's the task is timing, would that provoke a ramp up? Yeah, so honestly, okay. So in Anne Grabiel's original paper, they explicitly tried to um, differentiate between 